All right, so my name is Paul Powers and I'm founder and CEO of FISNA. Cool, what does FISNA do? FISNA ties together the digital and the physical and it understands what objects are, how they're related to each other and how they can be used. So okay. specifically use cases for that would be mm -hmm. to identify parts in the field, evaluate them, show you how individual parts can be used. That helps mm -hmm. to prevent unnecessary redesigns. It saves money on part procurement and really allows anybody to be an expert on whatever part it is that they have in front of them. Got it. So can you give me a use case, for example, of some client that you work with and how does he use your, your platform to achieve his goals? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, a lot of the customers we work with mm -hmm. are very confidential, but I can give you yeah. an example of one yeah. that's in the defense industry. Okay. And the way that they use FISNA is to identify parts with taking a 2D image. So okay. if they're in the field, they don't know what mm -hmm. something is. They take a picture. Mm -hmm. Instead of using regular image recognition, mm -hmm. FISNA will use the three-dimensional data we have on that okay. part and identify mm -hmm. not just what genre or category of thing that is, but specifically what it is. And then because we understand the three-dimensional relationships, mm -hmm. we can say, these are other alternative parts to this. And this is how this part could be used. Got it, pretty clear. So for example, I have a tank. Um, I got like a, a, a mine blew up under my tank and a bunch of parts are broken. What, what do I do? I just take a picture and this is, it kind of in a database and you guys kind of update it, like what has been broken and how it can be replaced? We would identify whatever it is that you took a picture of in that case and then tell you alternatives. So there might be a part number that you know, but let's say that part has to be custom manufactured. And in this case, your tank would be out of service for two weeks. Well, you might have something nearby that is the exact same thing, just has a different part number, which is, a lot more common than you might think. And so okay. getting the tank operational again would be in this specific use case, how someone would use FISNA. Okay, got it. I have so many questions because this this is interesting, a bit complex at the, the same time, um, but how do you get like all of those uh, pictures in the database you deal say with um, a, a, a company that has all of those parts do they pay you or do you, do you pay them to have their parts in your database? How do you go with that? Do you have partnerships with them to identify all the parts and have them in the database? How does that work? So there's two levels to it. Mm -hmm. The first is that we take the data from the customer. Very Sometimes the customer has it, sometimes they don't. Got it. But most of our customers have data on the parts mm -hmm. that they have. Mm -hmm. And cases where they don't, um, we can rely on public data. So FISNA has a site called thangs.com, T-H-A-N-G-S. And what thangs does is it works much like Google, but for 3D. So okay. it looks for models around the, the web. It crawls just like Google crawls for sites. We crawl for uh, models. And mm -hmm. when we see a match, we connect you to that link. So if you were to take a picture of something and, and let's say you didn't have the data, mm -hmm your database, then if you have the appropriate connection, then you'd be able to say, okay, I don't have this part, but these different companies sell it. And these companies maybe can manufacture. Okay, got it. Um, how much would I pay, for example, as a, as a tank uh, person, like Sam, <laughs> the army of XYZ country, is there a ballpark? Like, and my, my second follow-up question for that is, what would be my alternative? Well, let's start with the first one because I know like pricing can can vary. That's probably your your answer. I would guess it's probably in the the five or six figure. That that's more or less important. But what's my alternative if I don't have FISNA, for example? What would be my alternative here? I should probably highlight that FISNA is not exclusively or primarily in defense. We do have customers in automotive, oil sure. and gas, sure. etc. And sure. many users who use it for engineering and procurement, not mm -hmm. just for part identification. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question specifically, when it comes to how much you pay, it really depends on how much you're using it and the volume of users and data. So we charge annually based on the number of users that you have and also how much data you're using. So in this case, there'd be API calls. 
and you'd be pacing, paying on a combination of like the total number of users you have and the consumption of the of the product right so that would be how we would price it how much would you you would pay it would very it would vary drastically depending on how many people were using it and what they were using it for and how often they were using it so it's hard to give you a number but mm -hmm. i can tell you that's the pricing model right it's yeah. annual recurring revenue and then sometimes mm -hmm. consumption when it comes to alternatives that you would have mm -hmm. so right now if you're talking about part identification mm -hmm. there are a couple different routes you could go mm -hmm. Uh, really, well, actually, there are three. So right now, in the armed services, in particular, mm -hmm. in most countries, they rely on people who are material experts. So okay. they try to memorize, Oof. you know, essentially what parts are as specifically yeah. as they can. So, mm -hmm. and sometimes they'll fly them out, or they'll take a picture of it and send it to them, and hopefully that person will know. Wow. Oh, that's X Y Z part. Yeah. That's very hard to do when you're dealing with millions and millions of parts, oh, yeah. though, Crazy. and you definitely don't have the ability to understand if there are alternatives to that part because mm -hmm. you might even if you've memorized all the parts for that tank you mm -hmm. haven't memorized every part in the world period right so you Correct. don't know that there are 20 other components out there that work the exact yep. same way mm -hmm. so the second alternative is that you would use something like a barcode or an rfid right okay. and what that would do is it, that's a problem in itself. RFIDs are kind of, um, they can be expensive and un, mm -hmm. unreliable and barcodes yeah. can rub off. Both of them have the same problem though. They'll only give you the part number. So okay. if my uh, my tank breaks down and I scan the number, uh, the mm -hmm. barcode, mm -hmm. and it says, this is part one, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't know that there are other alternative parts out there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if I exactly. if it takes two weeks to get that tank part, I have to wait two weeks. And the same is mm -hmm. true with the material expert. So mm -hmm. FISNA is unique in its ability to identify exactly what something is and mm -hmm. compare that to alternatives that exist in the field. And that's only possible because we don't just rely on 2D image training. We also mm -hmm. have three-dimensional data in a unique way. Hmm. Interesting. So is FISNA alone in that category or do you guys have competitors? There are some companies that are working on uh, image identification for sure. I mean, okay. there you can do a Google image search, but the difference is really how we go about it. So okay. FISNA is unique in how it understands the physical world. Yeah. We basically turn objects into code mm -hmm. and that allows us to learn exponentially faster okay. than any other approach. And we have that patented. And Got so it. that allows us to be not only better with matching 3D data to each other, but also conveying an image to 3D data. So we're okay. more accurate than other approaches. Okay, so I have my tank, something broke down. Uh, your platform kind of tells me the for example, five alternatives part. Does it tell me like that there's this part in say, um, say I'm, I'm in Iran and um, I have this part in Kazakhstan. Will it tell me like that this guy has this part to sell in Kazakhstan? Presumably. So keep in mind what we're doing is very similar to Google, right? So mm -hmm. we're going to find that 3D model and this, assuming that the data you're searching is the Thangs database. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll find that model on the site that it's from and point okay. you there. As long okay. as that site tells you where it, that the seller's in Kazakhstan, yes. But we don't control, you know, that end of it. Just like Google okay. doesn't control the content of the websites you go to. Indeed, is it in your plan to control that end and even have an e-commerce part to it and actually sell the part on your platform? There have been some thoughts about different ways we could turn a things into a marketplace in some okay. ways. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, so imagine that what you have is an engine mm -hmm. and you wanna have, um, you need suppliers for it. You need people who can sell you the common components that are mm -hmm. you know, nuts and bolts that you're not designing from scratch, but also the custom components. And so in that case, what's unique about FISNA is not only can we source based off the geometry, what all those components are and what the alternative, you know, who can sell what. Mm -hmm. We can also analyze through our machine learning mm -hmm. who can manufacture that uh, custom component that no one's selling because you invented it, right? But who has the ability right. to manufacture that? That's not something we actively support today, oh. just to be fully transparent. We don't support okay. that yet, yeah. but we have the capability to do that, just not wow. integrated into things. So really with one button, you could automate the supply chain in the future. 
Why did you decide to start FISNA? What was the interest here? FISNA has, does something really magical. And I wanted ever my entire life to start a, a company that would be more than just a tool, right? Be more than just an app. And the initial reason why I started FISNA, I wish I could say that I saw the big picture at mm -hmm. the beginning. I, I honestly didn't. I saw one use case, which was mm -hmm. in patent law, you know, lawyers who are looking for different um, patent infringements or similar yeah. models, they had no mm -hmm. way to do geometric search. Okay. I tried the tools that were available online and they were mm -hmm. very, very bad at mm -hmm. seeing parts within parts and showing you, you know, how they related and um, in various ways it was really easy to mess up those search engines and they worked just, they didn't work right. So I realized that the right way to do it would be mathematically and um, had a back, a little bit of background in astrophysics and okay. some of the concepts there actually inspired how we ended up building these algorithms. Mm. And when we developed the software, we realized mm. that, um, but when we took talk to people out in the market, they had many more uses for it than I ever mm -hmm. thought was possible. I only thought of it as a, as a way of finding 3D data about patents, but we found very quickly, hey, this can help in so many different ways in engineering and procurement um, and warehousing and um, you know, in quality control. We had all these people come to us with these different use cases. Mm -hmm. And we realized we're actually onto something bigger mm -hmm. than what I initially thought we had bridge the gap between the traditional way of computing, which is just working with two-dimensional data mm -hmm. and understanding the physical world in its natural format, mm -hmm. right? So we created a code that basically bridges that gap. So software is able to understand physical objects and the mm -hmm. physical world and how mm -hmm. those parts relate, just like mm -hmm. it could understand how code relates to code. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what got me excited. But the initial idea was much more limited. Why did you decide to go with astrophysics at Harvard? I studied astrophysics at Harvard because I'm a very nerdy guy. Uh, I, I really was into <laughs> science ever since I was very young. I grew up homeschooled and yeah. I had the opportunity because of that to really mm -hmm. explore what was most interesting to me. And mm -hmm. science and technology was much more interesting than English literature, let's say. So I, you know, I was able to explore that area. What's more telling, I think, or what was more transformative is why I stopped studying that, why mm -hmm. I went over from that to, of all things, German law. Mm -hmm. And the reason was I had an epiphany that um, to achieve my goal, which was to leave behind lasting change in as impactful of a way as possible mm -hmm. through a, either scientific or technological breakthrough for the okay. future generations. That's been my goal since I was a child. Hmm. To do that, it felt like it was going to be a lot more effective to start up a company than to try to do everything on my own as an individual contributor somehow. Hmm. So hmm. realizing I wanted to be a startup CEO, the degree stopped mattering as much as the um, as what I learned from going to university. Hmm. And so I thought the key lessons that I would need would be, you know, how to learn on my own, how to, um, you know, take on tough challenges, how to take paths that others didn't take and um and also build out a network that would help me get started and so i thought i had an opportunity to do an exchange here in switzerland okay. and i learned german and i got the german law school and mm -hmm. i heard that you know there hadn't been an american um at least that they knew of uh that had ever come over to germany learned german <laughs> and then taken the german bar exam and passed okay. and so i thought okay well that sounds like a really cool challenge I never wanted to be a lawyer, no, not mm -hmm. even for a, a blink of an eye, I never wanted mm -hmm. to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But I realized that if you're gonna be going to starting a company, you could go to business school, you can go to law school, they're both very gen, uh, general degrees. Mm -hmm. But you know, law school in Germany sounded like just about the hardest thing I could take on. Okay. And part of it was to prove it to myself, part of it was to have an adventure and to mm -hmm. get to spend time out of the country. Okay. And part of it was to do something that would, you know, just changed my life and give me introductions to people I never would have met otherwise and mm. help set me on a unique path. Interesting, really interesting life path you chose there. I was an exchange student too in Hong Kong, so I have a, a similar thinking um, of things. Obviously I didn't uh, complete a, a law degree or anything in Hong Kong, yet it was challenging and changed my life in so many regards. So that's, that's quite interesting. And 
quite unconventional background that you have here. I also agree that in terms of value added uh, food, the, the value added food chain, I think the scientists pretty at the top there. I was thinking also like regarding this uh, yesterday, I think, you know, university our universities and all those institutions are, are kind of gonna go down and researchers, you know, the future of researching is probably like Apple is doing, you know, like making um, studies on people with iWatch, for example, I think that the future of, of research and studies will be owned by company. What do you think about that? I, I think that there's a lot of truth in what you've said. Uh, the whole university system, at least in the way that we have it set up in the United States, mm -hmm. is something that I think is somewhat untenable. You go to university to get a degree that takes up years of your life, mm -hmm. you leave with a tremendous amount of debt for in most people's cases. Mm -hmm. And only a small percentage of people, at least it seems this way to me, I don't know have the statistics on this, mm -hmm. but it would mm -hmm. seem that only a small percentage of people actually use what they learn in university later. I certainly don't use German law ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but I'm still glad that I did it. I learned a lot. And the okay. German law part was not what mattered. It was more about how to uh, more about myself, to be honest, Correct. how Correct. to persevere and do what other people think is impossible, even when people are suggesting what you're doing is too hard and you're taking on too much. Mm -hmm. So that was a big lesson for me, knowing my limits and Good. knowing that they're higher than I thought. Um, the universities in general, though, they're going to have to give way because of cost. It, they cannot mm -hmm. go on like this. And with COVID, a lot's been remote. I think mm -hmm. that we have a free access to all the information in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's really expensive to go have somebody tell you which part of that information you should learn mm -hmm. and pass an exam. And you're, you're really paying for the piece of paper at the end of the day, mm -hmm. more so than anything else. I think mm -hmm. that that probably will change in the future. I agree with you. Okay, interesting. What parallels can you draw or what laws of physics or astrophysics can you make the bridge between astrophysics and business. Do you have some of these laws that you use in business, some mental models that you can bridge out from one to the other? You know, I would say that it's almost, in, in some ways, yes. And in some ways it's the exact opposite because business okay. is both an art and a science. Yeah. And even though I'm about as left-brained and science-minded as they come, I do mm -hmm. recognize that's true. Mm -hmm. In science, it's okay to be just pure IQ, right? Mm -hmm. Pure intelligence works. But in business, mm -hmm. what's arguably much more important is EQ, right? Your emotional Indeed. quotient, how, yep. how you deal with other people. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, there are some common laws that apply to all businesses, right? And mm -hmm. But I think what is important to keep in mind is that most superlatives are not always accurate, right? Mm -hmm. Notice how I've tried to avoid superlatives there. <laughs> if you yep. say, this law applies to every business. I'm, I'm pretty mm -hmm. skeptical because what mm -hmm. I think the past 30 years or so of innovation have proven is that mm -hmm. every time somebody comes up with a theory on the one way to be successful in business, the one model you should follow, mm -hmm. somebody else comes out and makes infinitely more money by proving them wrong. Indeed. So I would say, unlike in the sciences, what you need in business is more mental fortitude Mm -hmm. less so than mental capability, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Being able to learn and unlearn. I guess the law of thermodynamics is one of the, <laughs> the, the, the best one and the, the most obvious one in business. And I was thinking about that just 15 minutes ago that you constantly need to reinvent yourself and a business never looks the same, not only because times are changing, but say I'm growing from 15 to 50 to 100 employees everything needs to change over and over again, which is why we need to be hyper comfortable in, in change and being comfortable with the fact that, you know, it's an adventure and you need to enjoy yourself up to the top and not only focus on, on the goals. And yes, sometimes enjoy the view. What do you think? I think that it's a splendid way to look at it. It's very hard to do. Um, some, it's hard to say that you're always going to be happy if you're going to be successful. Sometimes it's um, you do have to go through difficult periods mm -hmm. and you don't always get to stop and, and take in the view. Mm -hmm. 
but being able to do that is something that comes with time. You learn how to do that with time and you learn how to handle work loads that might sound really scary, you know, mm -hmm. um, to someone who's new to starting a business. You learn how to handle that without it emotionally overwhelming you. And I think that's part of what I mean by EQ. It's not just how you deal with others, but it's how you, it's your inner monologue, how you talk Indeed. to yourself mm. and how you handle adversity and, and, and stress. And if I could have one gift that I would give anybody who wanted to become an entrepreneur mm -hmm. that I thought would make them more successful, if I could just mm -hmm. choose one thing, it would be mindset, not knowledge, okay not even a network it would be mm. the right mindset because if you yeah. think the right way everything else falls in place indeed i would highly agree with that talking back uh about leadership um you know us entrepreneurs we always have really high expectations when it comes to us and one could say you know to be fair well you, you treat the others the same that you try and treat yourself yet the, the thing is here that inequality exists, we're all different. How do you make sure that when you outsource something to someone in your team, that they don't burn out through what you just give, gave them? That's a great question. And, you know, I make mistakes here like anybody else. And I think mm -hmm. part of being a leader is being open and vulnerable if you think that you make a mistake with something mm -hmm. and if there's a skill you need to work on. I think in times, uh, at times I've done that. I've been guilty of that myself, of mm -hmm. giving people more than I thought that I was giving them. Maybe mm -hmm. I, and if they're overwhelmed, then that probably means that either I didn't know enough about what I was assigning them mm -hmm. uh, to know that it was too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a different emotional state or a different mm. um, work-life <laughs> balance state than yep. I do. And so they can't work the hours that I just naturally assume that they're able to work. Okay. Um, and sometimes it's a lack of communication. Sometimes if you tell yeah. somebody, hey, do this, but you don't give them context, mm -hmm. they can misinterpret it and mm -hmm. assume it's a lot more work than it actually is. And mm -hmm. I think if I'm I'm sure I'm, I know I've made all three of those mistakes before, but the, <laughs> la, the, the, the last one there with sometimes, you know, giving people an assignment and over assuming how much context they already have. That's probably mm -hmm. one that I've made the mistake, the, the mistake I've probably made the most often okay. because it's easy as a leader who's, you know, as a CEO, you are involved in everything. Mm -hmm. And I know that everyone says, well, the leader just needs to focus on these few things. That's true. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm in reality, your folk, <laughs> do you have to get involved with a lot of things? And it's easy to forget that others might not always have the same overview of how all mm. the different things going on that you do. Mm. And so I try to keep that in mind now, but that's in the past, I've certainly made that mistake. And it's something mm. I try to avoid making right now. Mm. What habits do you have nowadays that give you focus and energy? So I think it's important to have a certain rhythm and routine in your life. Mm -hmm. So habits that help me are to try to go to bed and wake up roughly the same time every day. Okay. Uh, I, I work out, I exercise um, every day of the week. Uh, okay. Normally I try to get to the gym, sometimes I can, but then I do something else at home just to okay. get a little bit of, you know, to know that I'm moving my body, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I try to spend, and, and notice how I say try. Now, this doesn't always work, <laughs> but I try. As long as you try. To spend 30 minutes to an hour uh, doing something that gets my mind off of everything every day. Yeah, yeah. That's, really that's good. very hard to do. And sometimes that is just the working out because it's hard to okay. do both. But okay. if you can spend 30 minutes with a loved one or yep. if you have a hobby, just do something that, that takes up your mind. Just relaxing won't work if you're a true entrepreneur because you can't really it's really very hard to shut your mind <laughs> off uh, so you have to become obsessed with something else for 30 minutes to an hour and mm -hmm. i think that if you can do that every day it helps with your mental fortitude so at what time do you get up at what time do you go to bed and at what time do you work out generally speaking so uh, i'm a very transparent person but i would say that these probably aren't the best hours for everybody right <laughs> uh, i typically 
go to bed. I'm a bit of a night owl. Um, okay. I know most people are morning people. I, I, yep. I'm a morning I'm person not... by force, not by habit, <laughs> but not, yeah, not yeah. by nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so I typically go to bed around um, uh, midnight, but sometimes that Two. goes to two o'clock in the morning. And Two. I typically wake up around six. Sometimes that goes wow. closer to seven. Okay. So you sleep like four to seven hours. Uh, yeah, during on the weekends, I normally give uh, on Friday night into Saturday morning, I normally try mm. to sleep in. And okay. so I give myself time to recover from any loss of sleep. But I, I do yeah. typically manage to get five to six hours every night during the week. And at what time do you work out? Is it in the morning or after? Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, no, it's very difficult in the morning for me just because I'm not a morning person. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I've tried Is for years coffee? and it's just everyone has a different biological cycle. And for me, it's, it's more of a late one. So I typically work out around um, 9 p.m., sometimes at 10 p.m. Mm. Uh, every night for about an hour, normally go to the gym for an hour mm. at night. Um, it's probably better if you do it in the morning. That mm -hmm. would be a better way to do it. But mm. for me, the night is more sustainable. Got it. And it helps me to sleep later, knowing okay. because I've had that time to get my mind off of things for a little bit yeah, yeah got it any great books you're reading right now yeah there are a lot of them i think that there's a genre that i would like to recommend more than any individual one um i can yeah. re i could recommend 60 books that I, I think are great yeah i think if i could give someone more meaningful advice that would be a type of book to read okay. and most people who are either new CEOs or they're mm. uh, starting out on the journey, they read mm. lots of books on, on how to do something, right? Yeah. So strategies yeah. and, and tactics. Mm -hmm. And you will need to read lots of those books. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But when you're getting started, and even after that, you always have to at least make sure you're reading some, some kind of books that are about leadership psychology mm -hmm. and mindset. And I know mm -hmm. that that's a recurring theme here, but mm -hmm. mind, having the right mindset to be a leader is not something you're 100% born with. And even if you mm -hmm. are, you mm -hmm. still have to train yourself. It's mm -hmm. just like working out. You can't stop. Yep. So if you find books in that category that speak to you, mm -hmm. I would say that those are probably some of the most impactful and mm -hmm. um, effective books that you'll okay. read. Not necessarily self-help, but ones that give you the right perspective and help you to think the right way about business. A couple examples, so I don't just, so I, I give you an actual you yep. know, recommendation. Yep. You know, Zero to One by Peter Thiel's Good, Crossing the so Chasm's good. good. You know, those are, those are books that have a little bit of strategy in them, but the under, between the lines, a lot of it is about mentality and how to think. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the most important lesson. Zero to One is a classic. Crossing the, the Chasm is a bit heavy. Um, well, that, that was my perspective of it, a bit uh, boring, yet I'm going to re-attack it. I'm going to check the, the book <laughs> summary again. I've got like two uh, mental models for reading I've, I've acquired, and you, you couldn't uh, say it better the way you said it. When you start, yes, focus on those how-to book, but later on, I think you can max out that part really quickly. Uh, it certainly was my case where I would just open a new self-help book you know and it was more of the same and I, i'd get bored in the first chapter so really good model here i'm trying to attack as well uh, more science fiction books um which is related to to my next question what does the world uh look like in a hundred years from now oh i love that question this is something i think about all the time it's actually what inspires <laughs> me to get up in the you morning and in less than, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be more precise. I don't think okay. we're a hundred years out from this. I think a hundred years is too far. Okay. In 20 years at wow. the latest, okay. I think that the world is going to be fundamentally different in one way. And that is how we interact with technology. Okay. Right now, the majority of our interaction with, tech, uh, with software and everything mm -hmm. you would call technology mm -hmm. is input for output. You push a button, something happens. Cool. Um, it's, on, it's very heavily screen-based. Okay. I think in the coming years, what we're going to see is that the world is going to look at your situation, technology is going to look at your situational circumstance, okay. and the output is going to be custom tailored to you through, through mm -hmm. AI, mm -hmm. and it's going to be, in one word, immersive. The, okay. the world, you won't necessarily ever have to look at a device, or very rarely, only for certain mm -hmm. things. 
mm-hmm. for the majority of what you're doing, it's going to, the, the world will just, um, you'll be able to shape your reality to some extent. Yeah. And so you'll have different people walking down the street having different experiences. Mm. And I think the most powerful thing, what we really want with, with software and technology, if we're really honest with ourselves, mm. it all boils down to one thing. We, we want to be masters of our destiny and mas- mm. masters of, our, of what, what's real, right? Okay. We watch movies because we want to escape reality and live in another person's reality for a bit. Mm. What mm. if you could ex- change the, your overall experience of life and every meaningful way. What if you could create almost like a metaverse where you have the mm-hmm. ability to, you know, digitally um, experience places and things digitally that mm. feel almost as real as the physical world, if not okay. equally as real. That mm. I think is where the world's headed. And that's what excites yeah. me about FISMA because our main goal is to create the technology that makes these very powerful applications in the future that'll mm. make the world infinitely better for each person. Mm. to make that possible by mm. bridging that gap between physical and digital. So that's where I think the world's headed in 20 years. And I think in a hundred, if I, any, any guess right now would be pretty meaningless because growth is exponential. <laughs> and unless we, unless the world comes to a halt from nuclear war or some terrible disease or something like that in a hundred years, the world will be unrecognizable to us. Today. Really? That that's interesting. Well, first thing that the 20 years, I'm going to base my my response to that on the the year that I was say business conscious I think it began in 2010 so I can evaluate the the last 10 years I wouldn't say that the world has fundamentally changed since those 10 years I think I, I think right. that the 20 years uh projection is pretty ambitious um I think you could be right why um I'm I'm reading a really good book now, which I highly recommend to you, um, Amazon Unbound by Brad Stone. It's, it's uh, been released like recently and it details not, you know, the, the growth of Amazon as he previously did with a former book, but you know, the, the new stuff that Amazon got out. So Alexa, for example, and that uh, type of technology slash progress has been truly impressive in my opinion. Uh, that you can talk to a speaker and it can respond to you. It looks really dumb, but it's pretty, pretty cool. And it's almost science fiction um, when you, you think about it. It has this magic effect. And I do agree with you that tech will, will be more integral part of our lives. Um, what you seem to be touching on is s- some kind of smart glasses or s- some type of projector and highly adaptable technology. Would it be far-fetched to think that Amazon would be at the forefront of this revolution? I think that a company as big as Amazon will have a role to play. Mm. Uh, but I think that, well, and I, before I go to that, let me disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I do agree the past 10 years have been mm. disappointing in many ways. Okay. And there's a really good reason for that. And that's that we have had this disconnect between hardware mm. pro, uh, uh, development and software development. And um, there's been a big disconnect between new types of data, but in particular mm-hmm. in the 3D space. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind the world is three-dimensional, but we've most investment and most attention has gone to a, the, the 2D app in your pocket okay. realm. And we're getting to a point now where we're at a tipping point. The hardware, like you mentioned, smart classes, et cetera, mm-hmm. that is coming. We know that okay. Amazon is gonna spend money on it, but we also know that Apple, Google, Facebook, mm. Microsoft, mm. they're all mm. investing heavily into that space. Okay. And when the hardware comes, you know, and with the software that we're developing here at FISNA, and, with some, mm. and of course, other people are working on very viable okay. parts okay. of this ecosystem as well. Yeah. We're very close to seeing a huge shift. And okay. even though the last 10 years might seem a little dull, mm. what happened in the last 10 years was a new type of technology came out and that was the smartphone. And then yeah. it matured. Mm. If you look at, the, um, the few years before the, the past 10 years. So if you mm-hmm. look at, you know, 2000 to 2010, mm-hmm. all the, you, the world looks much more interesting, right? Because okay. you had flip phones to mm-hmm. smartphones with apps on them. And that yep. really changed quite a lot. Mm-hmm. So I think we're about to see that same kind of transition to a new type of not just device, but mm-hmm. experience of software. Mm, got it. Well, that should be pretty exciting to kind of have 
an AI, uh, aka it's a part of you because in the end we'll, we're kind of cyborgs to to kind of help you with your your everyday life. So that should be uh, pretty exciting and. Well, hope FISNA can be part of that. Uh, this is kind of the end, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time here and uh, I have to go too. So Paul, thank you for being here today. It was a really cool conversation, to be honest. And uh, I'll forward the, the podcast to you so you can have a, a listen of it too. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. You too.